Hello everyone. So last class we tried to uh, initiate a process where we tried to understand the how do we uh, assess and find the uh, you know, various environmental factors. In that we tried to discuss majorly about the thermal environment. However, if we talk about the physical working environment in that it is not only thermal we have illumination we have noise sound dust uh, olfactory and many other components okay which actually affects you uh, when you perform any kind of activity either it it is indoor environment or it is outdoor environment now concern is uh, we have limited uh, time period to discuss everything. So, already we are about to finish our course. So, what I am going to do over here that I will try to introduce the very important concepts and then you may try to do, uh, practice it or learn it at your end in little in more detail right because we have limited scope of time. So, uh, first today I will discuss about the thermal indices ok. So, what it is so uh, what we are trying to do is that measuring the state of thermal stress and comfort at the workplace. So, when we are talking about thermal indices it is very important for us to understand stress. So, if it is uh, more heat then also it is stress if it is less heat then also it is stress whereas if it is within a specific region where you feel comfortable then it is only comfort. So, we are going to understand these three different issues uh, in this particular section. If we talk about thermal indices we can understand that it is mainly divided into two component that is the thermal stress indices and thermal comfort indices. Under thermal stress indices we have cold strain indices because as I mentioned if it is beyond or less than the uh, comfortable temperature then also we uh, we perceive some kind of stress. If it is more than that then also we perceive discomfort or stress. So, we have cold strain in the indices and we have heat strain indices ok. Among cold stress we have several indices like WCI or we uh, revised name is W. Then IREQ that is the required clothing insulation, physiological measurement, thermal sensation, cold strain index, conductive heat loss ok. These are all varieties of methods available or indices available to understand the cold stress. Whereas, if we talk about heat stress we have WBGT index, we have core body temperature, heat stress index, ITS that is the index for the thermal stress and required sweat rate. Now, coming to thermal comfort, we have very specific three assessment technique that is the PMV that is the predicted mean value, PPD index that is the predicted percentage dissatisfied and local thermal discomfort ok. Now, due to time constraint probably we will be discussing each one of them like one from here, one from here ok like that we will be discussing. So, let us understand first the under thermal indices, stress indices what it is. So, it affected uh, by the worker exposure to amount of acclimatization that is physiological adaptation that occur allowing the worker to remain fit within environmental condition at a particular workplace. So, excessive thermal stress may cause the physiological and psychological stress among the worker because if we are talking about you know working in a very hot environment or working in a very cold environment it is not only physiologically we will get disturbed you know psychologically also we will be disturbed and finally what will happen it will affect our performance level. So, it is very important for us to understand that. So, let us begin with the cold strain index I will give only one example that is the wind chill indices. 
very early that is the 1945 simple and parcel invented or uh, tried to establish this method. It is based on the empirical experiment and the amount of heat loss is given ambient temperature and the concurrent air movement this particular uh, indices is being built upon. It also provides the temperature equivalent under in a particular calm condition. Now, slowly it is being revised in 1984 and we call it only the wind indices. Okay. So, it is based on the heat balance equation and it is improved and redeveloped in 2000 and 2001. Okay. So, you can understand that wind chill indices or wind indices whatever we call it according to the knowledge upgradation it is being changed and revised. So, let us understand how it works. So, if we see that there is a temperature of minus 28 degree centigrade and the exposure limit. So, again it is a very important thing. So, exposure limit as we uh, do uh, practice in the musculoskeletal disorder not only one impacting factor like repetition. If repetition is only once in a while it may not affect the, uh, the whole musculoskeletal system right. But if the duration of exposure is very high, then only it affects. So, here also similar concept as per the uh, as and when the duration of exposure is increasing, uh, what happens? The uh, strain indices also giving uh, like sad result like you know it is more affecting to the person. So, if it is more than 30 minutes and it is th uh, 20 degree temperature and wind speed which is you know kind of calm average. So, average 4.8 kilometer per hour then the risk of frostbite will be. So, actually basically what W does W try to understand or give an indication that what is the kind of risk you have to develop the frostbite because that is the kind of stress you are going to develop when you are working in a very cold condition. Okay. So, it is medium whereas, if you are working for 10 minutes in a minus 40 degree centigrade and the kind of uh, velocity of wind is more than 50 kilometer per hour then also it is high. Now, here it is a very nice equation that if it is 10 minute the combination 10 minutes 48 minus 48 degree centigrade and more than 50 kilometer per hour then also it is high. Whereas, it is 5 minutes more than uh, uh, like the you know, temperature is like minus 48 and the same thing which is the my, uh, more than 50 kilometer per hour then also here it is high. So, what is the affecting factor? This temperature and the exposure level. Okay. Now, coming to this temperature that is the minus 55 degree centigrade if it is that then we can say whatever the speed is speed of wind is. If you get exposed for uh, that particular type of temperature uh, no kind of duration of 2 minutes then risk of frostbite is very high according to this particular pre-calculated indices. Okay? So, this is very important for us whoever is going uh, you know or working in a condition like you know uh, soldiers or you know um, uh, people who are climbing mountains and all to understand this cold strain index very properly otherwise they may develop frostbite and risk of frostbite development if it is very high then you no know, health hazards are very turn in a bad condition. So, they should recover themselves very fast otherwise they may face the further consequences. So, this is very important for us. Now, I will not discuss all other uh, uh, like uh, cold strain indices I will move forward for very important heat stress index that is the 
uh, we can say WBGT index. Before I go to that, I would like to mention here that what are the risk factors for the any heat stress. Okay, so if we look at this particular chart, you can understand I categorized them into environmental risk, physiological risk and behavioral risk. So, if you talk about environmental risk, these are high air temperature, high humidity, high radiant temperature, direct contact with any kind of hot object and still air. Okay. So, these are the uh, environmental risk whereas physiological age like it is a personal uh, 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 no risk, age, weight, physical fitness, metabolism, degree of acclimatization, hypertension, prior any, any prior heat injuries etc. If we talk about behavioral strenuous activity, so if we are doing lot of strenuous activity, it is possible there is a, always a possibility that you will develop heat stress uh, very easily. Okay, dehydration, alcohol consumption, drug use, and uh, permeability of your clothing. So, if insulation is very high, then maybe what will happen? You will develop heat stress uh, very easily. So, uh, there are uh, you know, uh, stages of heat stress. So, uh, it starts with heat fatigue, then it causes the heat rashes, heat collapse, heat cramps, heat exhaustion and heat stress. And here I mention all the varieties of symptoms available for each kind of disorder. So, just for example, if we talk about heat uh, rashes, what will happen? Small red blister like you know, papules uh, on the areas of the skin like you know on specifically on your hand, uh, open, uh, open skins ok. So, there you will get so all this kind of thing and then you know uh, some kind of prickling sensation on your skin that you will be uh, actually you will be uh, uh, understanding or you will be facing those problems. The, um, the highest like when we are talking about heat stroke that is the maximum possible uh, disorder uh, due to heat, high heat. So, what happens? It is it, it may cause the confusion, ir uh, irrational behavior. So, you will not be able to behave properly, loss of consciousness, you may lose your consciousness, uh, then unusual lack of uh, sweating, hot and dry skin. So, all these uh, symptoms will occur and what will happen? What is the process? Because it actually fails the thermoregulation process of your body. So, that hypothalamus which is involved in the high, uh, no, thermal regulation of your body because we are mammals that whole process will fail ok and due to that history uh, will occur and this is the maximum possible condition due to high heat condition. Now, let us understand how do we uh, how do we measure dif, uh, no, this type of stress indices? Okay. So, very commonly used uh, heat stress index is WBGT index, weight bulb glow temperature. In my earlier presentation, I introduced you with the weight bulb, with the globe bulb, like globe thermometer and uh, weight bulb temperature, what all these things. Using those temperature, using those measurement, how do we calculate WBGT? So, this is the formula that we use for the uh, uh, when we are indoor and outdoor condition without any solar load. Whereas, if there is solar load, then we use this type of formula this formula. So, you can see this point 3 that is the globe temperature is divided into point 2 and point 1 in case of it is uh, you are having any kind of solar load and it is you know uh, adopted by this ISO. So, you can use it very conveniently and this is the very easy uh, method to understand the uh, heat stress in a particular working environment. Okay. So, uh, 
uh, how do we calculate it? So, you can see that measured over 60 minutes for continuous heat exposure and you can also do measure over 120 minute for intermittent heat exposure both way you can do and ideal WBGT is measured at a heat at maybe at the head level, at the abdomen level and at the ankle level. So, if you are standing and doing your work or if you are sitting and doing your work, you, you can measure at this level, at your abdomen level, at your uh, ankle level. So, you can understand that whole body how it is being exposed. Okay, And these are the formula you can use to uh, average out the condition and then using this uh, the, this is the basic formula and then you use this to make the average ok. So, WBGT is very very important and easy and useful method to understand the heat stress. So, what is the permissible heat exposure? Here I have a chart it is not uh, that it is no it is referred from definitely uh, the original paper. So, what it says we, we, we see here the work and rest regimen. So, 75 percent work and 25 percent rest if that is the combination then WBGT index you, you can see if it is light then it is this, this and like this. Okay. So, if you have temperature of this then you with this particular condition that 75 percent you are working and 25 percent you are taking rest you, you, you are getting stress of this. Okay. So, that is the permissible value. Now, if you see in your situation it is beyond your permissible value definitely there is a chance for introducing your design intervention. So, that is why being a designer, being an ergonomist, we practice to understand the heat stress indices in this particular context. Okay. So, coming to the thermal comfort indices. So, what thermal comfort indices. So, it represents the exposure of the human body to atmospheric conditions, air temperature, humidity, wind and the radiation. Measure of the human physiological response to thermal environment. So, very basic one is the PMV. I, I mentioned it earlier that is the predicted mean value. So, predicts mean value of overall thermal sensation of group of person. So, it is not a single person, it is a group of person as function of activity, clothing, insulation and four environmental parameters that is the air temperature, mean radiant temperature, air velocity and air humidity. So, when we are talking about a group of people giving their comfort responses, you know considering clothing, the activity that they are performing and other environmental parameters that is the temperature, air temperature, mean radiant temperature, air velocity and air humidity that will consider the predicted mean uh, vote or mean value. Okay. So, how do we do that? So, we measurements made in, uh, in a particular occupied zone that is the workstation or in a um, area where people are working can be directly measured by integrated sensors and complicated by and uh, particularly unsuitable in a you know, mathematical expression. This is not possible and uh, you can see that uh, this particular this one. So, ISO this is being adapted for, uh, for PMB. Okay? So, PMB value and metabolic rate that is the you know you can see the ranges are mentioned here. So, these are the recommended range for using standard PMB index. So, you can use this as a parameter and these are the ranges available. So, you can use this particular thing and you can get your PMB value for your uh, you know tested scenario. The next one very important one is the PPD. PPD value is the predicted percentage dissatisfied. 
So, it is derived from the PMB index and predicts the percentage of thermally dissatisfied persons among a particular group. So, buildings and vehicles uh, with respect to different uh, HVAC system, uh, whereas we are talking about heating, ventilation, air, air conditioning and everything. Okay. Specifically, when we are talking about, you know, in a uh, specific working environment in a building. So, those cases we use this particular uh, index uh, comfort thermal comfort index ok. So, different combinations of activity, clothing habits and environmental parameters uh, you know get uh, actually affect this PPD value. So, how do we measure it? It is based on a 7 point thermal sensation scale where whereas plus 3 talks about it is a hot environment whereas minus 3 talks about cold environments all are verbal expression. So, individual thermal sensations scattered around the mean value and it predicting number of people likely to feel uncomfortable warm or cool. So, uncomfortability can be warm can be cool as well ok and this is the scale that we use for the PPD index. Now, local thermal discomfort is also very important for us to understand because many cases maybe we may not use PPD or PMV. So, those cases we use ther local thermal discomfort. So, what it is? So, thermal uh, neutrality for whole body that is the necessary but insufficient condi you know maybe it is insufficient and condition of for the thermal comfort. So, those cases we use local thermal uh, discomfort and causes of local thermal discomfort may be draft vertical temperature gradient. So, maybe um, uh, you are standing in a particular position where you have uh, different temperature at ankle level, different temperature at uh, no, uh, abdomen level and different temperature at your head level. So, because of this difference in the uh, it is a gradient change ok. So, because of that you may develop some kind of thermal uh, stress and how comfortably you are handling it that talks about the local thermal discomfort. So, it is local very much local right. So, that is why we talk about ther local thermal discomfort. So, ASRI also follow this and ISO also follow this. Now, once we finish the thermal uh, thermal environment, it is very important that when we are breathing, when we are in a particular uh, work space, so the kind of air we are uh, consuming, uh, what is the quality of it? Is there any kind of, is it going to affect your performance? Of course, it is going to affect your performance. So, we also consider the air quality measurement in the physical environment uh, measurement category when to we talk about the ergonomical evaluation of any particular workplace. So, indoor air quality plays a crucial role in all of the environmental factors. It is defined by the pollutant concentration because you know whatever is available what when we are inhaling what is the kind of concentration of those pollutant and thermal conditions within a building affecting the health, comfort and performance of a particular occupant. So, when we talk about air, indoor air quality is very important. We are talking about right now the indoor air quality. We have two separate division. One is the chemical exposure or gaseous state pollutant, another is biological exposure or particulate state pollutant. Among this chemical exposure, we have airborne fibers, we have volatile organic compounds, we have combustion gases. We may not discuss all three, maybe we will be discussing any one of them. Whereas, we talk about biological, here also we have airborne particles, bacterial exposure and mold infection. Okay, here also we will be discussing one of them. So, first discuss airborne fibers. So, it is mineral based because we are talking about airborne. 
Okay. So, it is a mineral based fibers uh, when it becomes airborne due to the breakdown of the building material in like thermal insulation or uh, from work processes like glass fiber production. So, suppose you are working in a place where lot of dust is coming which is due to work. Okay. So, those type of cases and it is uh, like asbestos, silica and fibrous glasses dust are most common pollutant if we talk about the airborne fibers and pollutants are carcinogenic definitely and along with being mucous membrane and it is a skin irritants mostly, mostly these are all skin irritants. So, it is very important for us to know that how uh, what are the varieties of airborne fibers available and which is affecting the indoor air quality. Now, coming to airborne particle, it is defined by the particle concentration within a building and it is measured by using different measurement sampling method like airborne particles categorized according to the size of the ranges. So, if it is less than 10 micrometer then it is inhalable okay whereas respirable if it is uh, less than 2.5 micrometer particle so that way we actually try to understand there are varieties of instruments available you can uh, so dust analyzer and many other instruments available which you can use to understand the air indoor air quality now you can use airborne particle you can if it is there okay so that way you can evaluate them now coming to the pollutant monitoring and sampling method because you understand that what are the things available in you now you need to measure or you need to monitor the pollutants available in the indoor air environment okay so if we talk about the chemical exposure and biological exposure maybe we have a very specific method or sampling technique or pollution uh, pollutant monitoring process. So, if we talk about the chemical exposure or gaseous state pollutant, we have instantaneous monitoring system, we have integrated monitoring system, we have personal monitoring system, surface monitoring system or surface sampling and the grab sampling. So, these are all the process can be adapted when we talk about the chemical exposure. Whereas, we talk about the biological exposure, we have surface sampling, we have bulk sampling and we have airborne fibers. Among the surface sampling, we have vacuuming method, wiping method and tapping method. Whereas, for the airborne, we have these two method. Now, concern is these are all very much detailed method. So, within this uh, uh, th this may be the out of the scope of this particular uh, discussion. So, I will be introducing few of them in next slides. So, when we are talking about the pollutant sampling technique for gaseous state pollutants, I will introduce you to the instantaneous monitoring. What it is? It is also known as real time because we are talking about instant, instant we are going to measure it. So, pollutant exposure levels measure the shorter periods less than 10 minutes. So, worker exposure cannot be quantified for continuous exposure at, at a constant rate and it may result from a spot sampling. Okay. So, you have the instrument, you are there when you are worker is working and you are do doing the spot sampling with a varied time and location uh, wherever you are going you are doing that. That is the instantaneous monitoring. Whereas, integrating monitoring also is a continuous process, but it is little different than the instantaneous. What it is? It is pollutant exposure level measured for a longer period like from 15 minutes to kind of hours or 
maybe one hour, maybe two hour, maybe three hours like that. Okay. So, workers exposure can be quantified and interpreted multifacetedly and highly efficient exposure assessment practice for known pollutants and areas of concern within a particular workplace. Now, here it is very important that you should, uh, if you know the kind of pollutant you have within the air, then you can measure what is the kind of concentration, how it is varying due to time changes. Okay. So, that is why this integrated monitoring system is important for anyone to know. Then definitely personal monitoring, this is also very useful uh, method. So, it is uh, the pollutant sampling done by a particular kind of instrument, any may be dust monitor or dust sampler, which is for a particular worker. So, very important on a particular worker which is placed uh, within that particular worker and the equipment is attached to that particular worker. Okay. So, use of both active and passive devices. So, if we talk about active, that is the portable sample pumps maybe and passive monitoring badges. Okay. So, it eliminates the any, any kind of misleading monitoring because you are uh, on the, uh, the sampling is done uh, for a particular person when the person is working. So, the, the monitoring system is placed on the worker. So, it is very important and it is a, it's a very dynamic process altogether. Okay? Now, when we are talking about surface sampling, like when there is a workplace, there is a surface, how do you collect sample of it? So, it is performed on a fiber or particle con contaminants and exposure caused via direct connect and inhalation. Also, the sampling accumulated dust from a workplace surfaces. Okay, this is very also a good way uh, where you need to know lot about the uh, overall workspace. Okay, it's not about individual exposure. You are talking about the overall exposure level. And grab sampling, it is the sample of surrounding air at a particular workplace and collect in a sealed and inert bag for future analysis. Okay. So, you take it and you analyze it later. So, that is all about the grab sampling. Moving further, when we are talking about the, the other part. Okay, so, when I discussed this, uh, you can see that we have chemical exposure under that all this and when we are talking about the biological, we have surface, we have bulk and you have airborne fibers. Okay. So, let us discuss the next part. So, this is vacuuming, wiping and tapping. So, what is vacuuming technique? So, the surface dust assessment for concentration of you know endotoxins, endotoxins, then fungal uh, glucans and mycotoxin, all these things when it, you are going to assess from the surface. Okay? And the sample analysis indicates degree of contamination and potential exposure threat upon the uh, no, uh, resuspension. So, there is a suspension, again one suspension and then so it is happening. Okay? So, determination of endotoxin and the fungal glucan concentration done, maybe you can do use the, uh, we, we call it this particular instrument that is the LAL. So, that is Limulus amniobiotic. So, it is like you know you talk about lot of biological elements. Okay? So, that is the uh, pro instrument that you use where they do the bioassay. Okay, they do the bioassay and this particular uh, thing gives you a very good understanding what are the kind of concentration you have uh, uh, in terms of fungal, in terms of endotoxin, in, term, uh, in terms of mycotoxins. Okay, so that is all about the vacuum techniques. Next is wiping technique. It's the, it talks about the collecting via pre-packaged uh, swabs, 
okay you have prepackaged swabs and wrapping the so swabs over a smaller surface area and applying the swabs to the culture medium surface and then you check what are the varieties of what is the kind of growth you have in that particular culture so you can actually re uh, retrospect that like if this is the kind of growth you have then what was there at the surface level and then how uh, it is going to affect and what is the uh, kind of variety it has okay so that is called the wiping so what you are doing actually we are collecting the sampling through wipe method so that is why it is called wiping technique the last one is the tapping technique it is used to identify the major mold genera and uh, analyze the analysis is performed by using the light microscope with respect to 100 to 1000 um, magnification okay and specifically evaluates the presence of specific mold types because it, it is like categorization allowing the effective deployment of correction and prevention strategy because if you know this is the specific category is present definitely you can take measure against it okay it is not generic it is very specific identification that is the tapping technique now if we talk about all those things what is the kind of exposure limits that we can uh, think of so we have short term exposure limit that is the STEL then permissible exposure limit that is PEL and the threshold limit that is the TLV okay so uh, let us discuss uh, in a very short uh, what these stale pale and TLV so stale is the pollutant concentration allowed for the continuous exposure over shorter periods without av uh, any kind of adverse health effect. So, exposure periods usually last briefly about 15 minutes and it amplifies exposure limits in case of pollutants causing both acute and chronic health effects. So, maximum of 4 stale period allowed per 8 hours shift with at least 60 minutes interval in between. So, if you do follow this rule then there will be no hazard or minimal hazard at the exposure level. Now permissible how much you can perm, uh, do give the permission to, uh, to expose ok. So, the maximum pollutant concentra concentration allowed for the exposure without any critical health effects. So, it is defined via uh, like you know either ceiling value or time weighted average either the ceiling value that is the that is the top maximum uh, after that you you are not going to allow or the time weighted. So, within this time this much and if time increases then less if time lower down then exposure limit may increase so time weighted ok. So, ceiling value we call it that pollutant exposure limits not to be exceeded at any point of time whatever time it is you should not exceed this much ok that is the ceiling whereas time is the pollutant exposure limit calculated for 8 hours shift because that is the allowed time of any kind of work shift ok. Threshold limit value this is very very important and uh, what we can say that American conference of government and governmental industrial hygiene they publish it and values available for more than 700 pollutants ok. So, threshold value of more than 700 pollutants it is available and you can use that reference and you can use any one of the value according to your requirement ok. So, that is the threshold limit value. So, it is used for assistance in decision making of workplace safety protocols dealing with the exposure level fine. Now, instruments whatever is required for the measuring the air 
pollutant level. So, there are something called objective tools, there are something called subjective tools. So, when we are talking about objective tools, we have passive sampler, electronic detectors, sorbent tubes, filters, gas detectors. Whereas, we are talking about subjective, we have occupant survey and self-reporting questionnaire. All are easily available tool, you can pick any one of them according to your best fit in your situation. Okay? Uh, all those things when we are talking about air quality, indoor air quality, then it is very important for us to know the olfactory also. It is not about the uh, amount of gaseous or biochemical elements are present, how it is affecting your olfactory system. This is also very important that is why I want to introduce you to the olfactory. So, the regulation and management of the olfactory methods are available. So, you can pick any one of them according to your requirement and evaluating the detectability, intensity and hedonic characteristics of the environmental ordinance. It is very important because if uh, the olfactory is not really convenient for you. However, you have good air quality, indoor air quality, you will not be able to work. Okay? So, that is very important. So, set of methods used to evaluate the uh, uh, any kind of order characteristics in any indoor or outdoor environment and emissions causes annoyance because definitely if it is uh, it's a very bad smell definitely you will not be able to stay there right so it causes annoyance it causes complaints it causes discomfort so understanding the olfactory of a particular working environment is very very important so what what is the purpose of doing it so quality and acceptability very important terminology that is the acceptability however we can ensure the indoor air quality through thermal uh, you know through kind of a wind speed it has and all other factors however if there is any very uh, odd uh, no um, order is present then that is not acceptable by the worker. So, acceptability of the indoor air in a particular workplace. So, air quality uh, near the industrial facilities and sensitivity and responses of the chemical exposure. So, order perception because we are talking about order. So, we need to understand it is a perception by the person. Okay. So, it is a volatile chemical molecules be, uh, bind to specialized uh, receptors in a nasal cavity and it gives you the perception. So, information from different receptors organized in a particular pattern and recognition done via brain as distinct order with different characteristics. So, measurement techniques for order characteristics evaluate according to the concentration. So, pre-threshold and supra-threshold level. Now, when we are talking about sorry peri-threshold and supra-threshold. So, measuring the order characteristic we need to follow these two separately. Now, when we are talking about peri-threshold we know that is the ordnant concentration allows the distinct presence from the ambient air. Information about other odorants are unavailable because if this is specific one is available then maybe other things are not available. Okay. So, levels vary among the individual depending on the individual sensitivity. It is not same for everyone. Okay. I, I may I may uh, be very much sensitive to a particular fragrance. However, my colleague may not be uh, sensitive towards that fragrance. So, it if that fragrance is present, that may not affect him or her, but it may affect me. Okay. So, how how these things are being taken care? You know, you should know beforehand. You set up the workplace. And supra threshold that is the higher concentration allows the presumption of ordinance uh, present and uh, focused characteristic that is the perceived intensity 
quality and hedonic characteristics. Now, how do we measure? Here also we have, if we talk about the peri threshold, we have detectability. How do we detect it? Order detection threshold, static olfactometry and dynamic olfactometry. And if we talk about the supra threshold, we have intensity, we have hedonics and we have quality. So, these three things you can uh, characterize and intensity rating, ac acceptability and annoyance rating because you have scale, you see that what is the acceptability and what is the annoyance and the descriptive level. Uh, the kind of method we use for that, that is the maybe scaling as I mentioned and qualitative descriptive analysis. So, you just ask people about this thing. So, these are the method or tool you can use for the peri threshold and supra threshold. Now, when we are talking about uh, olfactory, we should know what are the modalities available. So, standardized methodology for determining the concentration of odors uh, along with the instruments that is the olfactrometer okay, and used in the uh, presence of any human panelist so that you can do it. It is very important some cases because in some chemical industries these are very very sensitive issues and you should take care of them. So, when we are talking about olfactometry analysis we have static, we have dynamic. Okay. So, what is static? We are talking about fixed con concentration of a particular order uh, present as a liquid chemical in a closed container. Okay. So, it is a fixed. It also talks about the amount of odorant uh, available in a subject's nose because if it is there in the environment, how it is coming to your nose and the vapor because it may vaporize. So, that is all about the static. Now, coming to dynamic, how do we do? First, we sample collect from the orders in a large non-absorbent container, then order uh, odorant uh, chemical extracted and directed for the to the olfactometer because you have an instrument named olfactometer, you direct it to them and then sample increasingly and subsequently sequentially diluted with the orderless air because you have a component which is having order and you are slowly diluting it. Okay, so, it is a dynamic process that is why it is dynamic olfactometer and panel evaluates via sniffing the ports at different concentration because you have slowly diluting. So, here the concentration is this, concentration is this, concentration and slowly when something comes which is orderless. So, how it is happening? So, how long it is taking? So, that process is the dynamic olfactrometry. So, that is all about the uh, indoor air quality environment and how do we take care of them in a particular or workplace. In the next class probably we will be talking about some uh, you know, component in the noise, vibration and illumination and then we will be finishing our course. Thank you. Mm -hmm.